I'm gonna meet so many smart people. Jesus, you've muted yourself. I have a soundboard too. Look. Oh. I think this is a good format. It's a good idea that you have and you should probably try to work it. Hello guys and welcome to a brand new live stream. <laughs> We are here with the useless game devs. Hello everyone, it's me. So today we are excited to be speaking with the creator behind the useless game development, a very unique name that has gained a lot of traction in recent years for its bold approach to indie game development. And now fresh from attending in Unite 2024, the annual Unity conference for those who don't know, we are curious to hear all about it. Welcome on this channel, first of all. Thank you for having me. I'm really glad. So let's dive right into that. You were at Unite 2024. What was the biggest takeaway for you? One of the biggest Unity news in in the last month was actually before Unite when they dropped the runtime fee thing that was responsible for a lot of mass exodus out of Unity uh, last year. But at Unite itself, I guess there were announcements for, I mean, there were announcements for Unity 6, but we have known about it for a while. Unity 6 is out like in a few weeks, I think, October 17, something. But there were uh, actually announcements for the version after that, which we don't know how it's going to be named. Mm -hmm. And there were um, three things that really caught my attention was the move to the old dot space architecture thing. They called it ECS for all. We used to have game objects on one side and, and ECS on, on the other. Now everything, even game object objects, will be built on ECS, which is cool. The other thing is the move to core CLR, which is the runtime. I think I think it's called a VM, but I'm not sure. This is the thing that runs C Sharp, made by Microsoft. So they they're moving away from Mono. Very cool because they will be able to be closer to the latest features of the C Sharp language is probably going to be a lot faster. And then there's a lot of things about optimizing the asset pipeline, like everything we'll be able to import in parallel, if I recall correctly, which means it's going to be very much faster to work in the editor. These are the three things I was interested in, and it's mostly about performance and quality of life for game developers themselves. Cool insights. Thank you very much for letting us know. I was also thinking about watching the live streams, but didn't have enough time for that. So yeah, thanks. And now, could you tell me a bit about yourself and how you got started in game development? Sure. I'm a software engineer, which means I have a master's degree in software engineering. I worked at a company that sent me to San Francisco, a French company, sent me to San Francisco to do some growth engineering, which is deploying technical skills for marketing purposes. And this was cool, but after a while I was doing like too much marketing, not enough coding. So I thought I would just quit and come back to France. And at this point, I was like, I always <laughs> thought that I would, I would want to uh, make games at some point, not especially like working in the game industry because I had no idea what, what this was like. So I went back to school to do a postmasters on video games. Uh, at large. So that was like 1.5 years. And then I started working at a few studios. And now I am not working at a studio per se because I have my own company and I do freelance consulting stuff uh, on games, VR stuff, game adjacent projects like stuff that are technically games because they're like they are, they're made in a game engine and they use the same mechanics, but they're made for more serious stuff like training people in a company to use a specific uh, a machine or something. So I do this and in parallel of that, I run my YouTube channel. My YouTube channels, because I now have a secondary channel. There's a new video out on the secondary channel tomorrow. <laughs> um, Making sure to check it out, guys. <laughs> yeah, sure. The main channel is, yeah, as you said, useless game dev. It's about making silly prototypes, stuff of small games, like small game mechanics uh, that I wanted to uh, experiment with or trying to reproduce a game mechanic from another game that does exist, but that I think is technically interesting to try and recreate or try to experiment with shaders and stuff. I didn't want to make a YouTube channel, but I wanted to, I, I've always been doing some side projects, game prototypes and everything. But the first obstacle I'd be like, okay, cool. I don't want to be doing that anymore. Next project. 
And I wouldn't go enough in depth with each project, but at the same time, like pushing the project uh, to a level of completion that is good enough to actually release. Even like if you, if you're not like making a paid version on steam or anything, if you just like have your blog or you ha have your h.io page and you just publish your small games and stuff, your small game jam stuff. It's so much more, more work to actually get the game in a state of completion that is good enough for the general public to start using. Like there needs to be a menu and an audio and um, a save system or whatever. And, uh, and what I wanted to do was to make really like small, like unique features, um, the small prototypes. And the YouTube channel allows me to do that. Like if it succeeds, like one out of 10 times, I just have to like film it 10 times and then I have enough to make the video and I don't have to fix the annoying bug or, or make it really ready for the public, which allows me to make multiple projects in a year. The last actual game I worked on was a 2D uh, side scroller pixel art. And in this time, I was making a lot more 3D stuff on the channel. Uh, like VR and stuff to just keep myself update up to date with the the, the latest like Unity versions, um, framework versions, and everything. The point of the channel is more for me <laughs> to stay up to date and and learn new stuff and build a portfolio uh, for clients or potential employers. If people want to tag along and and watch it, why not? Cool, I'm I'm all for it. Yeah, thank you. Also, my question was what inspired you to create uses game dev? So thanks for ask, asking to that question as well. So now, because I watched a few of your videos and I saw the game called Rude, I have yep. a question about it. What were some of the design challenges you faced when developing that game? So Brood, for the people who don't know, is a full actual game started with an associate friend of mine who does all the artwork and I only do code and stuff I, I can't draw. This project we have started a while ago. In terms of design challenges, there haven't been really design challenges because it's it's a game that is quite standard in a way. It's an adventure game. There's a bit of combat. There's a lot of exploration. There are quests, there are NPCs. Uh, you can you can just you can talk to people and stuff. And it's not something that is technically challenging from a game design standpoint nor from a technical, like from a development standpoint. Where the game really shines as something unique is in the visuals because it's beautiful. The design is geared toward exploring, discovering new areas of the world and, and, and talking with interesting characters and stuff. So it's more in the uh, visual and, and narrative design um, departments. Of course, there are challenges when you make a game that is visually striking is like you need to understand what's going on on screen since the backgrounds are so huge the camera is very like the zoom level of the camera the camera is very far away from the from the scene so your character is actually very small this is this is a wanted uh, features because we want to make you feel small in a big world but also in terms of readability if you need to know where you are you need to know where the enemies are if there's combat or to know what objects are underground that you can pick up and in terms of challenges but that aren't design challenges it's just funding uh getting money for the game is uh a nightmare we have the ability in-house to produce a good game in terms of uh, game mechanics if you have really cool and impressive uh, artwork for the backgrounds you also need to have equally uh, good uh, character animations, you also need to have equally good um, uh, music, like soundtracks and stuff. For this, you need to hire people who are very good at uh, animating 2D characters or doing 2D VFX, uh, like traditional uh, sprite sheet based v VFX. This costs a lot of money and we don't have a lot of money, so we need to ask people for money and they don't want to give it to us. It's always a risk to uh, invest to, in, a, in a game project, which is it's understandable because you it, it costs a lot of money up front and you don't and you don't know if the sales are going to make up for it or not until like after the after all the money has been spent and as a new company that doesn't have any sort of cv like uh, any any portfolio of, of existing games publishers and stuff don't really have a reason to uh, invest in our game 
So, mm -hmm. but that's that's the that's the main challenge, and it's also why we haven't been making any progress lately on Brood because we are at at a point where we need to find money first, and for this we need to um, either be able to grow as a company and then um, invest some of that money ourselves and then raise the rest, but with a, a, a better looking prototype or no, there's no or <laughs> this is <laughs> this is probably the only the only path that we can that we can take to move forward. I see it's a challenge, but hopefully it's going to pay off and you yeah, will get. Day. Yeah, just good things take time. That's always what I tell myself. So, yeah. And now back to your process. What kind of feedback did you receive during the early stages of development and how did it influence the products that you did in general? Let's talk about the channel itself. Uh, the general feedback, there are probably like three kinds of comments I get. Well, there's trolls, uh, but there's also like people who are way more advanced than me. It's like I try for every project to have a very different uh, topic, a very different uh, a technical uh, challenge to present and every time there is someone in the comment who is really skilled and so they are very he helpful because they come they come in and they say hey you should have tried this and that's always very cool because I learned uh, I learned but also like other people answer in the comments and keep asking uh, asking questions and stuff there's a back and forth of very like talented people like people who are way more talented than me the challenge is trying to display the information in a in a format that is interesting and en engaging that has like you know maybe a few jokes here and there without being too much too much youtube you know like hey guys today we're going to make this <laughs> like at some point you can't just make jokes you need to actually talk about the technical boring stuff and it's hard to make it interesting enough that people will keep watching the game industry is a very highly competitive uh industry and there are so many games coming out on steam like every day <laughs> that the marketing is sadly one of the biggest things um but if you already have a game that works and that's fun and that's playable it's already better in a way i mean there is there is factually like mathematically less money that is needed to complete the the whole project carl also asks why did you name yourself useless game developer i make like useless stuff like prototype of features that that really aren't made in an actual game or you know there there was one video about using a genetic algorithm for finding an optimal couch uh, shape and this kind of stuff is like it's it's meant to be useless and it's meant to be doing useless thing in a serious way like actually trying to to think hard about what the technical uh, aspect of the of the project is and even if it's for a goal that is not going to be interesting for an actual game or for an actual product or whatever. People call me a useless game dev and I know I'm like, but I also say I'm Leonard from the useless game dev channel. As we said, it's, it's a highly competitive uh, market. And even if you don't want to necessarily sell your game, there are very good games out there. And if you want to make a cool game, it has to be something unique in my opinion it has to offer something that other games don't because otherwise i i, I would just play the uh, established franchises to be honest can you walk us through your creative process how do you go from a concept to a playable game for example um let's say for a video the process is usually i think about something silly or i play a game and i'm like hey it would be fun if it was like if this part was the other way around i have a, a full list of of ideas but basically, it's like, I think I have a cool idea that I'm like, hey, this could be a video. This could be a video either because it's there is a technical thing that is interesting and I and I need to find the project around it that will make it, make it fun. Or there is a fun thing. Once I have the idea, I will leave it in a text file for years. Ooh. And then... <laughs> and then... <laughs> Whenever I'm 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 ready to make it the the next video, I look at the text file and I see and I take like the most interesting idea that I that I think is feasible right now. And then I spend like a weekend working on the project itself, like 
coding the thing, testing the thing. It's like a game jam, expect, except I'm I'm alone and I really don't have a deadline. And then I sp I spend another like maybe in total I probably spent about four days working on a project, which again it's very cool because I I can I can like move on to the next project very fast. Um, and after the four the four days I'm like I have a good idea of what I have like what works what doesn't what was interesting in in the development like will be interesting to talk about and i start thinking about the script meanwhile i'm also like getting finished on the on the previous projects because what i like to do is like i'm in the metro i'm in the shower i mean i'm in my bed whatever and i'm like hey it could be like i'm starting to envision what the final like what the intro could be, uh, where is there like a cool joke that I that, that I could put in there and everything. I write the script like exactly the voiceover of what I, uh, I'm going to say. What tools and software do you rely on the most during development? Just Unity and Visual Studio. I don't like to use a lot of tools. I don't like to use uh, obscure tools because when you go to an employer, for instance, and you have to be able to adapt to their tools. If you're too locked in in a specific um, box of, oh, I can't edit code unless it's in this uh, very obscure IDE that is uh, uh, very expensive. This doesn't make the people want to work with you. I exclusively use Unity. I am starting to get into Godot a bit because it's interesting that there is an open source engine. It's the same story as Blender, you know, it's like it used to be eh, like, of course, the 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 actual companies that make uh, closed source engines, uh, proprietary stuff uh, are going to like they have a better product. But Godot is actually starting to get very competitive. Your channel, were you surprised by the success of it? Or did you expect it to come considering all the effort that you put in? I wasn't expecting it to get any level of success at all because I know it's kind of niche. It's like, it's game development. This is already pretty niche. Like games is niche. Game development is even nicher. Um, and it's not tutorials, like tutorials can get pretty, uh, and courses and stuff, they can get pretty, uh, they can get a wide audience. This is not a tutorial, this is not really a, a like a devlog, like an entertaining, hey, here's my game and, and here's where I am in, in, in the development process. But, um, so I, I wasn't expecting it to get any level of fame and, and attention but it sort of did when the mobius video came out this is the one uh, i was talking about about um making a shader that basically mostly it makes outlines and this helps you show your like shade your game in a way that it it kind of looks like it's hand drawn but it's eh, it's not really good in my opinion <laughs> But still, it attracted a lot of viewers and many people are, are very um, interested in this style and in how you can make 3D look 2D. Visual stuff like rendering, it always uh, works pretty well. But this one really like exploded. I had, I remember I had 330 subscribers before this one. And within a week, like no, it took a week after that I had 20k. So really, it, it really blew up like crazy. It, it's coming down at the level that it would be at if the channel had just kept growing steadily, like organically, if, if this event hadn't, hadn't happened. Pretty cool because it gave me like, there's now a Patreon, there's now an audience that, that sort of follows my video. Um, I, I got invited to Unite. What's your vision for the future of indie game development? It has always been something where the big players like the triple A's and stuff push the envelope. They, they innovate, they, um, they create more demanding graphics. The indie scene is like keeping up with that, but with a few years or in sometimes in some cases, many years delay, there's just not the same budget. Like if you want to make a big triple A game with a, with tons of assets and a, a, and tons of, of characters and animation and stuff. It's like you need a team, like you need a large team, you need a large budget and everything. 
but it has been steadily keeping pace because there is innovation that sort of trickles down like the engines unreal or unity or godot they're all they add new features like they now have volumetric clouds oh cool volumetric clouds were like reserved for people who had like a, a huge team of engineers ready to to code this sort of a volumetric particle system and now it's like it's free it's in the engine it works out of the box and you can just sort of play with it and add it to your indie game. And it's also becoming easier to create um, assets. Like you have like the asset stores and everything, but if you create your own assets, it's also getting easier because there are better tools, there are better uh, processes. There's AI that's also starting to um, help you with that. And so it's like, it's getting better. To, it's getting easier to make the games that the big players were doing a few years back. You don't need to create a uh, Call of Duty. You don't need like a, a hyper realistic game because if you want to compete, you will not be able to compete. There are people uh, working at, at huge studios that that are doing stuff that is that is way out of your reach. And there are indie games that just take the opposite path. They're like, okay, we're, we're going to make something that is that is stylized, that is unique, that is uh, that is very pretty, but isn't necessarily like too complex. And there's like so many features and stuff, but they kind of all look the same. Like within the game, everything sort of looks the same, even though there's so much content. And between those games, like especially if it's a franchise, I'm thinking like about the Assassin's Creed franchise, for instance. The, the main complaint from the community has been that it's it's sort of been the same game for a while. And every time the settings change, like it's, it's Egypt and then it's Greece and then it's uh, France and the revolution, it's sort of the same game. And now you're seeing a lot of um, big titles, like big publishers and stuff. They're trying to to come up to come up with their own knowledge game. And it's like they're sort of copying, the, they're, they're letting the the indie scene innovates, not on the technical side, like not on the hyper-realistic graphics or the performance optimization and stuff. They're letting them innovate on narration, game design. And if there's something that sticks, they'll be like, hey, we can <laughs> still, <laughs> we can we can make it, we, like this is this is the new trend. We'll, we're going to make a, a game that is similar. Now, how do you think non-traditional games will shape the industry? For example, AI-generated games. Well, it depends on the why you're making games for. Uh, if if you're making games because, as in a way and as a, as a sort of uh, art form where you want to express uh, yourself, like you have a cool idea for a story, you have a cool idea for a, a world that you want to to show to people, and and you want people, or you have a cool idea for for a fun mechanic that people will enjoy playing as a party game or something. This is all independent from competition, right? It's like if you if you make your own project and this is something that you in your in your heart want to want to create, like it's going to be hard to sell if there are many other games on the market. It's going to be even harder when, when there is a, an actual like AI that can just shovel games onto Steam uh, automatically. And so it's going to be to be even harder because the, your game is going to be in an ocean of other games that may also be kind of cool and that people will want to check out. If you want to do this as a career and if you want to like actually pay rent and stuff, it's going to be hard and harder and it has always been hard. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, so maybe I should just believe in myself more and not allowing AI to take over. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. If you could go back to the beginning of your game dev journey, is there any advice you would give yourself? The thing is, I'm pretty happy with where I am right now in Great. terms of career. I think if I had made, done things differently, maybe I wouldn't be where I am right now and I don't know where I would be. So I don't, I don't think I would want to gamble, like if I had a time machine, I don't know if I would want to gamble going back in time and be like, hey, maybe you could do this and maybe it's going to be better for you in the future. But if I had to give advice to people who were starting in the industry like who aren't me i think you have to sort of specialize in a way 
Like I've always said, there's this sort of idea on the internet, and I think it's mostly from people who don't make games, that you can make a game on your own. Like the coding, the music, the visuals, um, the game design, everything you can make like the, the, you can make a, a game with a one person team. Well, that is technically true. There have been very good and successful games like Stardew Valley, for instance, comes to mind, uh, where this is like, like there was one genius, but at the same time, it's like there are thousands of people who try and they fail. And also, if you want to work in a game in the game industry, you are going to join a team. And this team, they will not want to have some sort of generalist, like someone who knows a bit of game design, a bit of programming, a bit of uh, 3D art, a bit of 2D art, a bit of music. You should rather like specialize in something. And it's also going to be very hard to make your own game on your own. The, the successful games that you see, like I think like Celeste is something, is a game that is that has very few few people. It was very successful. These are all survivors. You see those people who have succeeded and you're like, hey, maybe I can do it too. You don't see the thousands of people who have tried and have failed because they don't get invited on on in interviews and stuff and they don't they don't get to share their story on on their blog or something because they don't like nobody knows who they are. That's also something that I have to keep in mind because right now at the university we have to create a game in five weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. which means I have to focus on everything at once. It's a bit overwhelming considering that I just have a little bit of experience in everything. Like if you want to focus on making the, the, the art, you can like, you know, make your 2D assets and, and regarding like the programming, you can probably find some scripts for inventory management, saving systems, this kind of stuff. Or if you like me, you're more of a programmer, you can probably focus on making a game that it is is good and then fill in the visuals from uh, the asset store and that's that's fine i guess now because we are somehow closer to the end are there any upcoming projects you would like to share no <laughs> um the, the the way i think about projects is i try to not Oh. tell anyone oh. not even my my family my my oh. roommates uh, any, anyone about them because if they fail like if i don't succeed in actually bringing them to like to the channel or making it, it as a standalone product or something i don't i don't want people to come back and say hey do you remember that thing do you know like where where is it now i have you made any progress i'm like ah eh. I kind of uh, I chickened out of this one, and it's like I know it's it's better to to talk to people and to get support from your from your community from your friends. Uh, this is what gives you momentum to go forwards with your projects. But at the same time, I mean, if I fail silently and nobody is here to know about it, I don't fail. I don't let anyone see the big text files uh, of, of video ideas. Sometimes when, when there is a project that I know is like is nearing compression, uh, completion, I will start talking about it. That, that's, that's how I do it. I emphasize with this because besides two friends from the university, no one else knows about the YouTube channel. Well, of course, my parents, because I told them, hey, I bought the microphone. Why would I <laughs> bother to buy a microphone and stuff? So, um, yeah, but I've never thought about it like this way. If I fail, no one actually knows, but maybe it was inside me this thought as well. We got a also, question. It, it, it yeah. also means you can you can bring the, the idea back again, mm -hmm. like in a few, a few months, in a few years when you're more advanced or if you like if, if it sort of clicks and you're like, oh, I could actually be I could could actually do that now. It's not like you're not going to tell your friends like, hey, I resuscitated this whole project from five years ago. And they're like, ah, this again. It's like, oh, a new, a new thing. Cool. What do you think about asset flipping games if there's only one person that's working? The term asset flip is usually derogatory to mean that someone just bought assets and is mm -hmm. making like the bare minimum game in order to 
resell it based on like usually it's visual assets and people are like oh this game looks cool because it has cool visuals i'm gonna buy it and then they realize eh, there's not there's not much in it and like usually it's like it's sort of meant to mean a scam as in people taking assets that are cheap on the asset store and they make a barely a game and then they make money from it but if you exclude the term asset flip and it's just about like a single or small team of developers who use assets to make an entire part of the game like either the visuals or the music or even the code like you you cobble together a few like systems like i said inventory save whatever uh and a no code uh visual scripting thing like like unity has or godot has and then you make a game out of, out of this and you as a specialist focus on your thing which might be the visuals or the game design or as a programmer you focus on your thing which is the code and you get visual like assets from the asset store to uh, make your own game i think this is perfectly valid like if you see like pubg mm -hmm. this is definitely something where someone just had an idea for a cool mechanic that is battle royale um, you get dropped off somewhere, there's weapons everywhere, and you can just kill everyone until you're the last one standing. It's actual weapons from the actual real world. It's also like terrain and buildings that are probably used to be from an asset pack somewhere. And that's perfectly fine. I mean, it's, it's a very cool game. It's a very nice way to get your idea to completion. And that's very cool. If the main selling point of the game is the visuals, it's probably better that you do the visuals yourself. Like if you buy an, an asset pack with, that does all your visuals and you're like, this game is all about visuals. It's like, this is less interesting, I think. Like it's not, it's not a bad thing that it uses pieces from, from everywhere else. If the focus on the game is on something else like the mechanic or the technical thing this is i think this is a valid way to get your game out the door yeah true now a question that popped in my head uh do you have any favorite video game mm, yeah mm. <laughs> um i don't think i have like favorite video games but it's like every now and then i play a few games that let me look at my steam library I really enjoy because they're really new for me, like Chance of Senar, as I said. I played Sea of Stars recently, which was re very good. Outer Wilds definitely is is probably in a top three if there were to be a top three. Case of the Golden Idol was great. Sea of Stars was cool. I haven't played much this year, to be honest, because I was, I was focused on the one big project that ends tomorrow with the fire final video posted on the secondary channel like next games i want to play this is something that i can tell you horizon forbidden west mm -hmm. i want to play caravan sandwich dwarf fortress now that it has a decent interface and i want to try deadlock the new uh, valve game i really enjoyed it very interesting and nice interview thank you very much once again for accepting and also joining the discord server being active there like for everything literally no problem unity, unity versus yeah. unreal engine i haven't uh, experienced much uh, of unreal engine what i can tell you is it looks like it's a very big mm, piece of machinery if it's an engine it's a very big one and mm -hmm. it seems like it takes a, a while to know how to make it work. And it feels like there are so many features that it can appear bloated at times. But at the same time, it's probably the only thing for now that can rival with the custom made engine from the big AAA games. Like if you make a AAA game, it's probably the engine you want to use. Compared to Unity, um, Unity is right now seen more for the, uh, the mobile game the indie game the smaller games the 2d games and everything and i think that's better it's probably better than unreal on that in that regard you don't need all the hyper realistic things like features that unreal offers but unity is slowly catching up and uh, as we've seen at unite this year it's also it's also like really getting into like the proper triple a 
high fidelity rendering and everything. And then you have Godot, which is catching up in terms of small indie game, um, um, 2D or non-demanding non 3D, this kind of stuff. Like if you need to know what your project is going to need before picking your engine, because if you just pick your engine because it seems like Unreal is the best thing, or Unity is the best thing, and it's and it's just not fit for the type of game that you want to make. You're just you're just going to have to put in extra work to just circumvent the specificity of the engine, and that's not a good w way to do it. What were your thoughts before and after the announcement of runtime fee? So the runtime fee for me was really not about the money. If you like, at first there was this. Like some people were doing uh, calculations where you could you could see that from the terms that they were putting out, they could like sort of bankrupt companies that made like free to play games. They really didn't think about all the corners of the markets before announcing those things. But the final version of the runtime fee was to me completely reasonable. You already have $1 million in the bank before they come knocking for up to 25K. It's really reasonable. It was really not about, about the money. What, what was really important, and, and it's a good thing that they canceled it because that signals that they, that they don't want to do that anymore, is the breach of trust. It's like retroactively, hey, you put your trust in us to, to, to make your next project, but we are going to retroactively change the terms. We're going to make you pay a lot of money. Um, we are going to, to change a lot of things. We're going to lock a, a lot of features behind this new version. And so you have to upgrade and everything. It was kind of predatory. Like it was really not nice. <laughs> um, it's something like they, they, they had been hostile to their users for a while, trying to just like squeeze them for extra money. They were basically working more for their shareholders to try to like please them doing things that would get the, the shares to go up rather than work from the for the users who actually use the engine and want to uh, make games. And it feels like now that they canceled it, they're sort of signaling that they want to go back to a time. They also did that with the versions. They were like, hey, we're going to 2019, 2020, 2021 versions. These are going away. We're going back to like the, the last version was Unity 5. We're making Unity 6 and probably Unity 7 and probably Unity 8. It's like we're trying to go back to this time where Unity was about the game developers who make games, and we are going to work for the developers because this is this the community is what makes us as a company uh, valuable to shareholders. So they they have been signaling that they want to gain our trust back and that they want that it is going to be uh, lack all times and everything. Now they still have a lot of work to do to actually rebuild the community because it takes a lot more time to rebuild than it takes to destroy. From what I've seen at Unite, uh, both in the public uh, talks, but also behind closed doors, uh, talking with Unity executives and stuff, they know that they have a lot of work to do. They are ready to do it and they, are, and they have already started working on rebuilding. Um, so they are aware of that. I just hope that they can do like it, it feels to me like Unity is still sort of falling. I just hope that they can reverse course before all the users leave. Thank you very much for all these insights. Uh, my game takes one gigabyte of memory. Will it work properly on Android? I have no idea. The, um, I recently saw a documentation for a plugin uh, on Android on mobile and they were like for iPhone. Uh, it will work on this, this, this model because I have tested it. And for Android, there are just too many models out there. I don't know if it's going to work. <laughs> you need to just test. You need to, for everything, uh, you need to define what hardware you want to to target. When you say Android, is it the Android form for, from like right now, from like this year and onward? Is it like, do you want to support up to three, five years ago? Do you want to support all Android, including like the, the models from 10 years ago, probably not. So you have to evaluate what the work is going to be like to support so many years backwards mm -hmm. and that many years uh, forward and see what you can afford. If you're like, I don't really care if 
like a smartphone from three years ago cannot play my game, you will probably be fine with one gigabyte of memory. Um, because nowadays mobile games, like the new mobile phones that come out, they have sufficient memory. Um, especially if it's like, if, if it's a game where you only play the game and you don't switch to other uh, activities when while you're playing it's it it should be fine but I'll also do tests get a get an old android phone and see if it works and if it doesn't ask yourself do i want to support this generation of phones or do i want to focus on the next one or the next one i think it's also useful to do a, a little bit of research before to see exactly how many users are using that android version and so on yeah Definitely, I think there are websites mm -hmm. where you can just check mm -hmm. what Android version, what iPhone, like what iOS version is currently in use with the with the percentages, and you're like, ah, there is this feature that I want for my game, like this uh, cool function that does whatever on the GPU or something, but it's not supported in Android eight, and you see that actually it's only like three percent of the population, and you're like, sorry guys, it's I cannot like if I if I want this feature, I'm gonna have to let you go. Like the three percent of you. I really liked it. I had a lot of fun and I learned a lot of stuff. Yeah, me too. My <laughs> my throat is sore now, but <laughs> I, I also had a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. Thank you for inviting me. There are a few other content creators that I would want to see on this type of of program uh, because I want to know what they have to say about these types of questions or or I'll, I'll be in the chats asking the yeah the hard-hitting questions make sure to um, that i hope you continue the series like I, I know you can uh try to reach out to other content creators and i hope they say yes because it's it's fun yeah it really is thank you so much and uh we'll see you each other in the discord server i guess sure and uh probably yeah. at uh unite next year oh my god <laughs> who knows who knows? Yeah, who knows? Yeah, thank you very much once again, and I'll see you around. I'm waiting for the video, by the way. Make sure, guys, tomorrow to check out his video. Subscribe 6 now. 6 p.m. CEST. Oh, okay. On the secondary channel. Yeah, yeah, it's already scheduled and everything. Um, the secondary channel is, is called Useless Game Stuff, and it's about everything except game development. And right now, the the series of videos that are, that is going to be concluded tomorrow is about cooking all the recipes from Stardew Valley in real life. So if you <laughs> like cooking, or if you want to me fail to see me fail at cooking, you can watch it. I'll make sure to paste the link uh, after this live stream in the comment section, so it will remain there. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much, and thank also thank you guys for being here. I'm non-conformist, you. you are useless game dev, and yeah, take care, we'll see you again. Thank you very much, I... have a good one. Bye. Thank you.